They said 1986 was the year. Garlic's third world championship. Bernstein's funny card domination. Glidden's amazing comeback. All the records, the crowds, it was a season unequal until 1987. Historians will come to call this season of NHRA championship drag racing the year of wonder. The year every wild dream about performance, speed, elapsed time was fulfilled. The year of first time winners and new world champions. They said nothing could top 1986, but that was before 1987. For 10 months, they travel the country, the racers competing in NHRA's Winston World Championships, visiting 14 tracks, battling for their share of a million dollar jackpot. The battle begins in Pomona at the season opening NHRA Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals. This event always sees records broken, and this year was no exception as Kenny Bernstein, in qualifying, established a new elapsed time record at 5.48 seconds. There was lots of action and excitement in the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator. Tim Morgan was in the far lane and had trouble. Morgan's car slid down the racetrack, then overturned. The engine was still running when it finally came to a halt on all four wheels. Morgan climbed from the car uninjured. Pro Stock Eliminator found a race in round number two that was to set the stage for the season. Butch Leal in his Pontiac was in the near lane. Bob Glidden in the Ford Thunderbird was in the far lane. A great start for Butch Leal. And a close win for the Pontiac. Leal used that starting line advantage to take the victory. Leal ran 7.52, Glidden much quicker at a 7.45. In the finals of Pro Stock Eliminator, Leal in his Pontiac was racing against Warren Johnson. Johnson in the Oldsmobile was in the far lane, Leal in the near lane. The advantage at the start again to Leal, but the horsepower of the Oldsmobile of Johnson was evident and Warren Johnson won his first ever Winter Nationals title. The final of Funny Car pitted not two racers against each other, but two countries against each other. Graham Cowan, the Aussie Raider, was in the near lane racing against Kenny Bernstein. The Australian and American flags were flying from the push vehicles as these two cars approached the starting line. Kenny Bernstein was looking for his first ever Winter Nationals win. Graham Cowan out of Sydney, Australia, was looking for his first ever NHRA win on any racetrack. A great start for Bernstein. Problem set in for Graham Cowan when the engine let go and a ball of flame erupted out of that Pontiac funny car. Bernstein streaked to the finish line at a 5.49 second elapsed time as Graham Cowan brought the car to a slowing stop at the end of the track. In slow motion, it is even more graphically evident the size of the explosion in Graham Cowan's car. At the time the engine let go, Bernstein had already pulled away to a commanding lead and when Cowan's engine exploded, the race was over at that point. Bernstein was the Winter Nationals champion. The Top Fuel final brought Joe Amato and his wife Jerry to the starting line with their TRW Hearst special. In the far lane of the racetrack was Don Garlitz, the reigning world champion. He won the title a year ago, becoming the first driver ever to win back-to-back -to -back Winston Top Fuel titles. He's now tied with Shirley Muldowney with three world championships to his credit. And here at the Winter Nationals started off the 1987 season much as he ended and dominated 1986, making it to the final round to race against Joe Amato.
Garlitz with his car super streamlined in the front, the canopy over the roll cage. Amato, a more conventional style dragster. It was a great start for Garland. And his Super Shops Kendall Dragster continued to extend the lead 5.29 seconds. His speed 270 miles an hour as the world champion won the Chief Auto Parts Winter National. So coming out of the all-important first race of the season, Big Daddy Don Garlitz and Kenny Bernstein picked up where they left off in 86, each leading the respective category. Pro stock driver Warren Johnson won his first Winter Nationals, the first time he's had the early points lead. Gainesville Raceway in Gainesville, Florida is the home of the Motorcraft Gator Nationals. That was the next stop on the 1987 Winston World Championship Trail, and it saw record-shattering performances. In qualifying, Darrell Gwynn had driven his Budweiser special to a new elapsed time record, a new low ET mark of 5.22 seconds. To set the official record, you must run a backup within 1% of the new record. In the second round against Shirley Muldowney, that's what Darrell Gwynn was aiming for. It was a tremendous race, and Daryl Gwynn ran 5.26 seconds, backing up his earlier record. Woo! I can't believe it. I'll tell you what, the heat of the day, 526, in front of my hometown fans, this bud's for you. I, a little I, bit of heaven, huh? You bet. This is heaven right here. Tell me about the ride itself. Did you see Shirley all down the course? No, I never did. Matter of fact, I had to hold the brake in low gear because it spun the tires on the dry burnout. But uh, we got two more rounds to go. So you were using the brake as an acceleration tool, yeah, really? It smoked the tires on the dry. My dad told me when I backed up from the dry burnout just to tug on the brake just a tiny bit. So that's what we did, and it worked. Great job. Thank you. Billy Meyer and the Chief Auto Parts Special provided his own brand of excitement in funny car qualifying. An engine explosion as Billy hit the throttle when he was trying to make a qualifying attempt left a shambles of a $35,000 high-tech engine. Billy was uninjured in this incident, but the crew faced a tremendous amount of work trying to get the car and body back together. In the first round of competition, it happened once again. Not quite as spectacular as in qualifying, but the end result was the same. Also in the first round of competition, Don Prudhomme, returning to the sport after a year-long layoff, faced a longtime rival, Tom McEwen. Prudhomme won this race with a 5.70 second elapsed time and advanced through the second round into the semifinals, where he matched against the reigning world champion, Kenny Bernstein. Prudhomme failed to qualify at the Winter Nationals, but at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals, he was showing the form that carried him to four World Championship titles. Prudhomme had a smooth start, but Bernstein ran into problems and tagged the outside guardrail. Prudhomme advanced into the finals of the Gator Nationals. As you can see, it was Bernstein with his hands full when the car made a sudden move to the left and into that concrete retaining wall. The finals of Pro Stock Eliminator matched Ford against Pontiac, Butch Leal against Bob Glidden, continuing the rivalry that began a race earlier at the Winter Nationals. And Glidden left the starting line too soon, handing the automatic victory to Leal, taking the nationwide Pontiac across the finish line and the Gator Nationals championship title. The Funny Car Finals found Don Prudhomme racing against Johnny West. West drives for Roland Leong. Don Prudhomme used to drive for Roland Leong many years ago and won a number of national event titles at the wheel of a Roland Leong tuned car. At the start, Johnny West ran into problems. A flash of fire came out from underneath the car. Prudhomme streaked on to take his first win in five years and his first Gator Nationals championship since 1980. 
A disappointed Johnny West was still looking for his first national event victory while the Skull Bandit crew was obviously happy. A brand new race team winning the second time out. Did you ever even believe that was possible? Well, <laughs> you really? know, well, you know, not exactly. I figured we we're going to have to struggle a little bit more than we did to get in the winner's circle. We had a couple of good breaks, Steve. You know, Bernstein's car is obviously uh, still the killer car, and uh, we're going to take this car home back to California and run and test and work on it because uh, I'd like to win the championship again. The finals of Top Fuel Eliminator found the new national elapsed time record holder, Daryl Gwynn, in the near lane of the racetrack, matched against Joe Amato. Joe was in his third consecutive final round appearance. That streak dated back to the Winston finals a year ago. Gwynn had to be considered the favorite in this race by virtue of his establishing that new elapsed time mark at 5.22 seconds. But a great hole shot by Joe Amato, plus some outstanding performances, put Amato in the winner's circle. For Daryl Gwynn, it was a record-shattering weekend, but not a victory. Elation reigns supreme in the Joe Amato camp. And on the basis of two final round appearances, Joe Amato had taken over the top fuel points lead from Garlitz. Kenny Bernstein, well, he had everyone talking. Could he possibly be stopped? Pro Stock, Butch Lille, two final round appearances. He now had the lead in Pro Stock. Next on the agenda for the NHRA Winston Championship season was Dallas, Texas, the Texas Motorplex, and the Winston All-Stars. A brand new race in 1987. This event matched the 10 best drivers in each of the three professional categories. Prior to the actual racing, a number of social events occurred as this was the gathering of the true all-stars of drag racing. Very similar to the all-star type format in Major League Baseball. The Texas Motorplex provided a fitting challenge for the all-star drivers that participated in this race. On the one hand, this track provided the traction necessary for outstanding elapsed time and speed records. But on the other hand, if you got into problems, it was a difficult racetrack to cope with. That was evidenced in this qualifying matchup between Bob Glidden at the wheel of the Motorcraft Thunderbird and Dempsey Hardy in the Oldsmobile. Glidden went through the quarter mile in a new elapsed time record of 7.31 seconds. Hardy had problems. Dempsey managed to keep the car upright and was uninjured in the accident. In the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator, Daryl Gwynn was riding a crest of a wave. He had established a new elapsed time mark of 5.17 seconds and was racing against Dick LaHaye in the Miller American Special in round number one. A giant wheel stand for Daryl Gwynn put him out of competition. Dick LaHaye advanced into round number two. In funny car racing, Kenny Bernstein qualified in the 540s, was running 530s throughout the race. Mike Dunn driving Joe Pisano's car had run over 273 miles an hour in qualifying. That was one of the fastest speeds ever, but records were not available for setting at this event due to the invitation-only all-star format. This was a race of the quickest against the fastest. Mike Dunn ran into problems. His engine let go. He got the parachutes out and brought the car to a safe stop as Kenny Bernstein advanced into the final. The engine explosion and resulting fire in Mike Dunn's car was quickly brought under control by the onboard fire extinguishing system required by NHRA. A scary moment that ended well for Mike Dunn. While Joe Lapone waited on technical approval for his new Chevy Beretta Pro Stocker, he borrowed back his old car from a year ago to race against Warren Johnson in the finals of Pro Stock. Johnson at the wheel of the Mr. Goodrench Oldsmobile Forenza had a lot of power at his disposal and he used every bit of it to eke out a win over Joe Lapone and take home the $15,000 first place award at the Winston All-Stars.
the use of a borrowed car carried over into funny car eliminator. Kenny Bernstein at the wheel of the Budweiser King raced against the Kodiak Blue Max, but it was not Raymond Beetle at the wheel. It was Tom McEwen, referred to for this weekend at least, as the Blue Goose. McEwen had established some all-time personal best performances at the wheel of this car, but it was no match for Kenny Bernstein, as Bernstein took home $30,000 in Winston prize money with a 5.36 second elapsed time. The finals in Top Fuel Eliminator saw Dan Pastorini at the wheel of the Coors Light Silver Bullet against Dick LaHaye in the Miller American Special. The weather, which had been bad all weekend, finally took a turn for the worse. The rains came and the closest either driver would get to actual competition was a foot race. Whether on foot or behind the wheel of their race car, the staging procedure is the same. Dick LaHaye left the starting line too soon. He left the red light glowing, but needless to say, Dan Pastorini did not collect the $30,000 first place award at this event. That competition was moved to the next race on the NHRA Winston Trail, the Nationwide Auto Parts STP Southern Nationals at Atlanta, Georgia. Before the actual competition got underway, one thing was left to be decided from Dallas, and that was who will take home the $30,000 Top Fuel Award in the Winston All-Star Race. Dick LaHaye had to be considered the favorite. Pastorini had been having engine problems all weekend. Despite the performance advantage, no one was counting Pastorini out, as this was the site of the former NFL quarterback's first ever national event win a year ago. Pastorini's engine problems continued to plague him. LaHaye streaked on for the first ever Winston All-Star victory and $30,000. In this first round race, Joe Amato was against Gary Ormsby. Ormsby smoked the tires, and Amato smoked it through the quarter mile to set a new speed record at over 279 miles an hour. In the second round of racing in Top Fuel, Daryl Gwynn had his eyes on a new national record. He was the number one qualifier at a 5.23 seconds Darrell was racing against his fellow Floridian, Don Garlitz. Garlitz, since his Winter Nationals win, had been having lots of problems. Don qualified well at the Southern Nationals in the number five spot, but seemed to lack the consistency that he is famous for. Garlitz exploded an engine, and Gwen set a new national elapsed time record at 5.204 seconds. Garlitz's problems continued on this run. This was a rather rare occasion for Don Garlitz. Very seldom do you see the swamp rat explode into a ball of flame. But the problems internally in the engine caused the backfire through the supercharger, which then blew it off the motor, resulting in that ball of fire. I cannot remember the last time Big Daddy exploded a supercharger. No one is easier on parts and pieces than this veteran. But, Don, that was quite a kaboomer. I haven't seen you do that in a long time. Something uh, must have dropped a valve, I guess. There seems to be a rash of that going on, particularly in the funny car camp, but they don't know what it is. At least you have an idea here. Well, it has to get fire in the manifold from something. It obviously something, it was because it wasn't doing anything wrong. It was just kind of moving along. All of a sudden, it backfired. How did it feel to you before this happened? It was decent. It was making a good move. You know, it wasn't no, nothing spectacular, but... In funny car qualifying, Ed McCulloch lined up in the far lane of the track, Jim Head in the near lane. A tremendous driving job by Ed McCullough kept the Miller American car from overturning. As the car left the starting line, it immediately moved to the right. Ed corrected. The car started out of control. As it crossed over the center line, it ran into the rear of Jim Head, then rocked up on the left wheels and header pipes, sliding down the racetrack. McCulloch brought the car back to four wheels and drove it to a safe stop. Billy Myers' problems continued at the Southern Nationals in the second round against John Force. Meyer was lined up in the far lane of the racetrack.
On what appeared to be a good run, Billy Meyer had another engine explosion. The body blew off the car. Meyer and the chassis bounced to a stop as he spun it out in the racetrack and climbed from the car. In slow motion, you can see the body just peeling away from the vehicle. After the engine exploded, the resulting flames went down very quickly. And Meyer, in the four-wheel equivalent of a Texas bucking bronc, rode it to a safe stop. This has proven to be a very frustrating and expensive season thus far for Billy Meyer. The finals of Pro Stock Eliminator found a rematch of the recent Gator Nationals. Bob Glidden, the loser by a red light at the Gator Nationals, raced against Butch Leal at the wheel of the Pontiac. Coming into the finals, despite 52 national event victories, Glidden had not won at this Atlanta track. But there is always a first, and for Bob Glidden, 1987 saw him the victor at the Southern Nationals. Well, I am standing next to one proud bird and one uh, very proud Hoosier. You finally conquered Atlanta, Bob Glidden. I'll tell you what, I not only conquered Atlanta after the episode that went on here last year, but I finally beat Leal in a final. This is the first race we've won all, won all year. Uh, you know, I know the people at Ford and people at Motorcraft are going to be glad to see the Thunderbird come through finally. In the funny car finals at the Southern Nationals, the reigning world champion, Kenny Bernstein, was racing against John Force. This was the ninth final round appearance without a win for John Force at the wheel of the Castrol GTX Oldsmobile. Bernstein got a good start and a four car length victory over John Force. His elapsed time, a 5.55 second run. The top fuel finals saw the number one and two points leaders in the Winston World Series at this point, Joe Amato and Daryl Gwynn, go into the final round. This was another race of the quickest versus the fastest. Joe Amato had set a new speed record, while Daryl Gwynn had established a new elapsed time record. Whoever ended up the winner came out of this race with the lead in the Winston Championship points chase. Problem set in for Joe Amato as he neared the finish line and Daryl Gwynn won his Southern Nationals title. 5.29 seconds was his elapsed time. What a season for Top Fuel. Three races, three points leaders as Daryl Gwynn used all of his bonus points to head the list. Funny Carp, well, Kenny Bernstein putting further distance between he and his competitors. Pro Stock, Butch Leal. Three final rounds, the points lead continues. Staying in the Deep South, the Winston Championship Trail moved from Atlanta to Baton Rouge, Louisiana for the Sitco Kmart Cajun Nationals. The finals of Pro Stock Eliminator saw the first championship round appearance of Bruce Allen at the wheel of the Levi Garrett Camaro of Rare and Morrison from Arlington, Texas. Allen had the dubious distinction of racing against Butch Leal, making his fourth consecutive final round appearance thus far this year. Butch defeated Bob Glidden in the semifinals. A close start for both drivers, but Butch Leal had the advantage by half track as problems set in for Bruce Allen. And Leal, with a 7.53 second elapsed time, extended his lead in the Winston points chase. The funny car points leader and defending world champion Kenny Bernstein was once again in the finals, this time at the Cajun Nationals, against Johnny West. Johnny enjoyed his second final round appearance this season. He finished in the runner-up spot to Don Prudhomme at the Gator Nationals. Once again, West had problems. This time, he crossed over the center line 
gave the win at that point to Kenny Bernstein, who notched his third victory out of four races thus far this season. Johnny West had problems from the very start. As his car left the starting line, it began a move to the right that did not come to an end until he had crossed the center line and had disqualified himself. For the fourth time in four races thus far this short season, Joe Amato was in the final round of an NHRA championship drag race. His competition was Dick LaHaye. This was a race between the two top qualifiers at the Cajun Nationals. Amato had to be considered the favorite based on qualifying. He finished in the number one spot, while LaHaye found his performance potential and qualified number two. A tremendous race evolved at the very start, and it was just as close at the finish. Dick LaHaye won the race by a matter of a few inches. Amato had a very slight advantage at the starting line, but this was one of those classic drag races where neither driver knew who had won the race until they had an opportunity to talk with the crew at the end of the racetrack. For Dick LaHaye, a happy moment, his first win of the year, and an improvement in his point standing. Well, no one had been able to keep Joe Amato out of a final round so far in the season. He continued to lead the points, but could hear Dick LaHaye coming as LaHaye moved into the third spot just behind Gwen. Kenny Bernstein continued dominant, and Butch Leal opened up his points lead over Bob Glidden. Columbus, Ohio was the site of the fifth race of this season as National Trail Raceway hosted the Budweiser Spring Nationals. In the second round of Funny Car Eliminator, Kenny Bernstein had his share of problems. The smoke that came from the headers on this race car indicated severe engine damage and Bernstein was forced to shut off the engine. That automatically gave the win to Don Prudhomme. This was only the second time this season that Bernstein had lost a race, and both times it had been lost to Prudhomme. If the fans at Columbus thought it was a rare occurrence to see Kenny Bernstein shut off on the starting line, how about Top Fuel Eliminator? Joe Amato raced against Gary Ormsby in the semifinals. Ormsby at the wheel of the Castrol GTX Special was in the far lane of the racetrack. Don't forget, Joe Amato had been in four consecutive final rounds. But it was not to be at Columbus, as first he smoked the tires and then exploded an engine. It was instant tire smoke for Amato as he left the starting line. Then some problems in the engine caused a huge ball of fire as the supercharger exploded. For the Amato team, it was not a normal weekend. The finals of Pro Stock. Bob Glidden against Butch Leal once again. These two drivers have now raced each other in every national event thus far this season. Including the Winston All-Star Race, Leal held the one loss advantage 3-2 over Glidden. Glidden evened the score at Columbus, winning his 54th national event title. Billy Meyer moved into the finals of Funny Car Eliminator to race against the hometown favorite, Jim Head. Head, a construction engineer, is based in Columbus, Ohio, and the huge crowd was rooting on their favorite. Meyer had apparently solved the engine problems that had plagued him in the early part of the season. 
Despite what appeared to be a red light, Billy Meyer and Jim Head both had a clean start. Head began to drift towards the center line and was forced to shut it off, and Billy Meyer was the winner. So a long, hot day has come to an end for Billy Meyer, but he's not thinking about that right now. Your 11th NHRA national title. Been a long time since the 10th, though. Yeah, I think uh, some of my guys will be, uh, even though we've been in the final round every year, it'll be uh, three years, which is uh, hard for us to believe next week. So I'm glad it didn't go to three years. I can keep it in the two-year range. Gary Ormsby made his first final round appearance since the Cajun Nationals of 1986 in what appeared to be a brand new race car. Actually, he used part of the old streamliner that he had campaigned for over a year and a half, converting it to a more conventional style dragster, and in doing so, picked up some tremendous performance gains. He raced against Dick LaHaye in the Spring Nationals Finals. LaHaye had the advantage off the starting line, Ormsby smoked the tires, and LaHaye won the Spring Nationals. This was the second event in a row for Dick LaHaye to visit the victory circle. For Gary Ormsby, the tire smoke, the loss of traction, put him out of contention for the Spring Nationals crowd. Even though Joe Amato failed to make the final round for the first time in 87, he continued to hold the top fuel points lead. The Dick LaHaye with two consecutive victories, starting to make Amato and Gwen in second place very nervous. Kenny Bernstein dominated all the way, and Bob Glidden got closer to Butch Leal's points lead with his victory. The next stop on the national event trail was Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and the Molson Grand National. In a real turnabout in performance, both Kenny Bernstein and Bob Glidden were defeated in the first round of racing. For Butch Leal, he continued his amazing string of final round appearances. This was his sixth this season. Racing against Leal in the final was Bruce Allen. The starting line advantage for Butch Leal was the margin of victory at the finish as Leal won his third race this season. In the Grand National Funny Car Finals, Ed McCulloch was considered the underdog. The favorite, not only with the fans, but based upon his performance, was the man who was making his 10th final round appearance, John Ford. Fors had yet to win a national event title, but this was his day as McCulloch lost traction and John Fors won the Grand National. Top Fuel Eliminator saw the two dominant cars in competition, Dick LaHaye against Joe Amato. Joe had been in the final round of five NHRA national events, winning one. For Dick LaHaye, he was aiming for his third straight national event title. This was a rematch of the finals at the Cajun Nationals. In this case, Dick LaHaye was the number one qualifier. Joe Amato was number two. Another tremendous race, and Dick LaHaye won his third consecutive title, tying an NHRA record. And that third victory for LaHaye vaulted him around Darrell Gwynn into the second position in top fuel points. Joe Amato started to see his lead being eroded. In Funny Car, the big story, John Force. His first win moved him from fifth to third, and Butch Leal could breathe a little easier with a thousand-point lead over Glidden. The state of New Jersey was the next location for the national event trail as Englishtown hosted the Budweiser Summer National. In qualifying, Dick LaHaye had established a new national record at 5.17 seconds. That level of performance continued through the first two rounds of competition and brought LaHaye into a head-to-head -head confrontation with Joe Amato in the semifinals. 
LaHaye was looking for his fourth consecutive top fuel title, which would have established a new record. But dire smoke off the starting line took LaHaye out of contention, and Amato moved on to the Summer Nationals Finals. Records were also established by funny car driver Mike Dunn. In qualifying, he had run 270 miles an hour, and with this run of over 268, Mike Dunn reset the official national record. That win over Tom McEwen moved Dunn into the semifinals where he raced Kenny Bernstein. Dunn smoked the tires and Bernstein crossed the finish line first and advanced into the finals. Pro Stock Eliminators saw a first-time finalist, Jerry Ekman from Ventura, California, race against the veteran Bruce Allen. This was the third final round appearance this season for Allen. His last win came at the 1985 Grand National. Ekman pulled ahead at the start and maintained the lead through the finish line to take his first ever national event victory. I was so thrilled to win. It's just such a thrill. It's like I said, it's those once in a lifetime thrills that come your way. And I was so happy for myself, for Bill Orndorff and the crew, Ron Swift, that we were able to pull this off and our new sponsor, John Waldy. And we're just thrilled to death. The finals of Funny Car Eliminator found a continuation of the rivalry between Kenny Bernstein and Mark Oswald. Oswald, driving the Motorcraft Thunderbird of Candies and Hughes, was a three-time winner last season. And Oswald pulled the parachute early. Bernstein was the winner for the fourth time this year. Oswald, in his first final round this season, had a very slight advantage over Bernstein at mid-course. By the time they approached the finish line, Oswald had built a lead of a few feet. Then as they approached the speed trap, Oswald miscalculated, pulled the parachute early, and Bernstein, by inches, won the race. In an incredible display of season-long performance, Joe Amato made his sixth final round appearance at the Summer Nationals. He raced against Gary Ormsby, and Amato went into a giant wheel stand. When the car came back to the racing surface, severely damaged was the front end, the engine also had problems, and Ormsby streaked on for the win. Amato's giant wheel stand started just a few hundred feet off the starting line. And then it slammed back to the pavement and the engine let go. An incredible set of circumstances for Amato. Six times he's been to the finals, and yet only once has he won. Well, Joe's back didn't hurt quite as much when he saw that he was still leading the top fuel point. He and LaHaye starting to pull away from the competition. John Forrest, he moved into the number two spot behind Bernstein, and Butch Leal going out in round number one to Glidden, while well, Glidden served notice he was planning a mid-season charge. From the near sea level conditions in New Jersey, the NHRA National Event Trail next moved to the rarefied atmosphere of Denver, Colorado, and the Mile High National. In one of the most important races of the day, Dick LaHaye was matched against Frank Bradley. Bradley, at the wheel of the Newman Farm Special, was considered the underdog. But as LaHaye smoked the tires, Bradley moved ahead by a few inches, and that was the margin of victory. That win in the semifinals brought the upset-minded Frank Bradley into the final round against Joe Amato. Surprise, surprise, for the seventh time this season, Amato was in the final.
Frank Bradley's victory skein started in 1976. His last win came at the 1984 Summer National. Amato built up a lead off the starting line that was not challenged by Bradley, and Joe Amato won his second top fuel title of 1987. The Pro Stock Finals at the Mile High Nationals found Bob Glidden against Bruce Allen in the classic Ford versus Chevy battle. Glidden earlier had defeated Butch Leo in the semifinal. Glidden won the race and began a strong move towards another world championship title. Kenny Bernstein against John Force. That was the finals in Funny Car Eliminator. While Bernstein smoked the tire slightly, he was able to recover and pulled ahead of John Force to take home the Mile High Championship. The Winston Point standings in Top Fuel and Funny Car remain pretty much status quo. The big story in pro stock. With Glidden taking out Leo in the semis, he moved within 100 points of the lead. You'll recall in 86, this was the race where Glidden mounted his charge. From Denver, Colorado to the land of 10,000 lakes, Brainerd, Minnesota was host to the next national event. This, the Quaker State North Star National. The long-awaited debut of Don Garlett's brand new car took place at this event, and Swamp Rat 31 went down to defeat at the hands of Daryl Gwynn in the first round of competition. Also in round number one, the man that was leading the Winston points chase by nearly a thousand points, Joe Amato, received an upset loss at the hands of Gene Snow. In Pro Stock Eliminator, the winner of this race would be in control of the Winston points chase. Bob Glidden defeated Butch Leal to take over the lead in Pro Stock Eliminator. In the final round, Bob Glidden and his Ford raced against the Chevrolet Beretta of Bruce Allen. The rare and Morrison car was making its second consecutive final round appearance, having lost to Glidden at the recent Mile High Nationals. The improved aerodynamics of the Beretta body over the previous Chevrolet Camaro have obviously paid dividends for the rare and Morrison team. Allen had the advantage off the starting line, and in a reversal of what occurred one year ago at the North Star Nationals, Allen defeated Glidden. What a victory for you. What a leave off the starting line. I can't, I'm, I can't tell how happy I am for Chevrolet, Levi Garrett, Buddy and Dave. All the guys at the shop, we've been working hard. I mean, I, this is great. I can't, I'm, I'm the happiest guy you've ever seen. Just like Pro Stock Eliminator, the Funny Car Finals at the North Star Nationals was a rematch of the Mile High Race. Kenny Bernstein was in the far lane against John Vores. Kenny had built up a commanding lead in the Winston Championship Series to this point and was making his third consecutive final round appearance. In fact, he had won the previous two events. Bernstein's dominance continued at Brainerd, Minnesota, as he put away John Force with an elapsed time of 5.60 seconds. The finals in top fuel at the North Star Nationals matched Daryl Gwynn against Dan Pastorini. In his march to the finals, the former NFL football star turned professional drag racer was matched against Dick LaHaye in the semifinals. LaHaye was considered the favorite as he was now improving on his point standings in the Winston Championship Series. But Pastorini proved to be the upset maker in this case. A lot of tire smoke, loss of traction for LaHaye, and Pastorini moved into the finals but mechanical problems put him out of competition 
and that gave the win to Darrell Gwynn. The victory for Darrell provided a dramatic improvement in his standings in the Winston series, and that made a three-way race of it between Darrell Gwynn, Joe Amato, and Dick LaHaye. For Dan Pastorini, his second national event win still eluded him. Joe Amato's upset in round number one allowed Dick LaHaye to continue to gain ground on the top fuel leader. In pro stock, Bob Glidden not only defeated Butch Leal in round number one, but drove around him in the points column to boot. The first time we'd had a new name at the top since the Winter Nationals. Next on the agenda was the biggest drag race of them all, the U.S. Nationals at Indianapolis, Indiana. The three-time top fuel champion, Don Garlitz, was not in competition at this race as the result of a horrendous crash suffered at Spokane, Washington. The car went into a 200-mile-an-hour wheel stand at the finish line and overturned. The injuries sustained by Don, though not serious, were enough to keep him out of competition for the remainder of the year. The record book was shattered in pro stock qualifying. Bob Glidden and his Ford Thunderbird ran a speed of over 191 miles an hour. I think uh, in our case, uh, the aero people, the, the engineers at Ford Motor Company have uh, uh, given us a lot of help in that, in that area. And uh, our car is really stable at, at 190. Mike Dunn rewrote the record book once again. In qualifying, he ran over 278 miles an hour, getting very close to that magic 280 mark. In the first round of competition, Dunn ran 274 and set that as the record. Well, this car's been running fast all year. When Kenny went 274, uh, you know, we felt we could run 275, 276 if we get her hooked up off the starting line. And uh, 278, that's a little mind-boggling, but, you know, hey, we'll take it. While Dunn was close, Amato was there, the first driver ever over 280 miles an hour. I've gotten breathless, Stephen. You know me, I never run out of here. Tim Richards put a combination. We made a good run this morning, and he was felt confident that the car. So he told me we were going to go for ludicrous speed. That was the word we were talking about for the last hour over our pit, ludicrous speed. Just kidding? No, he's been serious. He was serious. He said it's either going to work real good or real bad. He said it was the most change he's ever made in the motor for one, one step, but he said, no, we've got to try it. And all, everybody's been talking about all week here is 280, 280, and Indy seems a place to run 280, and they run 280 here at 525 and end up low ET. It doesn't get any better than that, Steve. In addition to the U.S. Nationals, Indianapolis Raceway Park also hosted the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge. The defending champ, Bruce Allen, was driving the Chevy Beretta. Bob Glidden and the Ford Thunderbird trying for his first ever Pro Stock Challenge win. By a couple of car lengths, Bob Glidden was the Pro Stock Challenge champion. The eight best bunny cars in the world met in the Big Bud Shootout. In the finals, Mark Oswald was against John Force. Oswald lost traction. Force won $50,000. My sponsors, my crew, my wife, <laughs> Austin Coyle, baddest person I know, and all the people up there. I love all of you. And they love you. Got no words here, man. I understand. John Force has been waiting so long for this. An earlier national event went in Montreal, Canada, was not televised. Many of his fans were unable to see it. And here is the crew for John Force. The biggest payday in this man's professional drag racing career. The finals in Pro Stock Eliminator saw Bob Glidden trying to win his third consecutive U.S. Nationals title and his eighth overall Nationals win. That string started way back in 1975. Racing against him was the Chevrolet Camaro driver out of the Wayne County Speed Shop, Darrell Alderman.
Alderman made a race of it, but Glidden was not to be denied, and Bob Glidden won the U.S. National. Bob Glidden, that's eight U.S. National titles. That's right, Steve. The Thunderbird was thundering today for sure. I'll tell you. I know how I feel, Ed, and the kids have got to feel great right now. Daryl did give us a good race until I feel neck to neck till half track. Uh, damn, I'm, I'm telling you. This was a little tougher race for you than it might have looked like from the grandstands. Well, yes. Uh, the prior round, we had wheel hop really bad, got crossed up, nearly hit Butch. Uh, we had no idea what was going to happen. We kind of threw the dice. We, we told Darrell we were going to take the right lane, and then, well, we decided we'd take the left lane, so I guess the boys made the right decision again. Terrific job. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. The dominant force in funny car racing, Kenny Bernstein, was matched against the fastest funny car in the world, that of Joe Pisano, driven by the defending U.S. Nationals champion, Mike Dutt. Coming into this final round, Bernstein had only won this race once before, that back in 1983. There was concern within Bernstein's crew because of an engine change that took place after the semifinal. Dunn smoked the tires and Bernstein streaked on for the win. Can you believe you're even here? No, it's hard. And you said it. The crew, Dale Armstrong, Mike Wood, Jim Mayo, Charlie Nielsen, and Daryl Gwynn's crew, and all our friends. The Tom McEwen was in there. My goose, the Coors goose, come in there and helped everybody. We couldn't do it without them, i tell you. And Budweiser, Quaker State, and Buick. And a 553. I mean, they just came right back with a bare short block motor. Well, they did. Dale does it that way. That's the way he has them prepared because he changes the combination so much. But you never worry if you don't run out of time. But they put on the kangaroo shoes and ran hard on that one, Steve. Indeed. Kenny Bernstein, U.S. Nationals champion again. Oh, it's, great. it's a great one, I tell you. There's nothing better than the U.S. Nationals. Nothing. The leaders in the World Championship points, Chase, met in the final round of Top Fuel Eliminator. Dick LaHaye raced Joe Amato. Amato attempting to back up his 280 mile an hour run. An added dimension to the story was that neither driver had ever won this race before. What would it mean to Joe Amato to win his first ever U.S. Nationals in top fuel? Well, Steve, to win the Nationals, the big one of all time, and hopefully set the speed record and back it up in the final, that'll be a storybook ending and a dream come true. I don't know if I could take it. It's probably the most important race of my whole career. It, uh, you know, this is the grandfather of all drag racing, and it's the biggest drag race of the year. And uh, to win this would just be astounding. I mean, I, I would probably be lost for words, to be truthful with you. And we'll have to wait and see what happens at the other end. There was a tremendous amount of importance riding on this single race at the U.S. Nationals. First, there was the bonus points by virtue of the size and prestige of the Nationals bonus points in the Winston Championship chase are awarded to the winner. There was the possibility that Joe Amato could pick up the bonus points that are paid by virtue of establishing a new national record. For Dick LaHaye, a win would move him even closer to the point leader, Amato. Amato got the lead off the starting line. It was a close race at the finish, but Joe Amato won his first ever U.S. Nationals title. Well, Steve told me it was going to get Steve. It's going to be okay, Steve. That's okay. I'm not excited enough to God, the U.S. Nationals. <laughs> Tim told me it was going to be real tight, he said, but you're going to have to weld them to the tree. You know, we've been driving real good all day, and I've been just concentrating a real lot on the tree. And I've been getting real good lights, and, you know, I've gotten my eyes picked out the last race, so I came here with the idea that I knew I was going to have to do real good, and, and thank God they gave me enough power to do it. Amato's performance in the final round was not enough to back up the 283-mile-per-hour record for bonus points, but his win over LaHaye moved him further into the top fuel points lead. Kenny Bernstein, Bob Glidden both also padded their margins. Reading, Pennsylvania was the next stop after Indianapolis and the Castrol GTX Keystone Nationals. 
Rain forced a one-week delay in eliminations and as a result created a tune and test day for the racers. Kenny Bernstein took advantage of it and that proved disastrous. Bernstein's car, out of control, on fire, ran off the racetrack and ended up upside down in a swampy area at the end of Maple Grove Raceway. Bernstein's car suffered mechanical problems partway through the run. That, in turn, led to the engine explosion, which engulfed the entire car and the cockpit in flames. The engine continued to pump fuel through the broken fuel lines that fed the flames and Bernstein sat at the core of a 200 mile an hour fireball. Bernstein, extricated from the wreckage by the NHRA safety safari crew, was uninjured in the accident. The car did not fare quite so well, but after an all-night session, the crew was able to rebuild the chassis, put on a spare body, and Kenny Bernstein returned to competition, where Kenny's luck took a change for the better. In the first round, Bernstein received a bye run that allowed him to check out the rebuilt race car. In the semifinals, it was Bernstein against Mark Oswald, the defending champion. Oswald had been the performance leader, and that proved to be true in the semifinals when he put away Kenny Bernstein with a 5.52 second elapsed time. In the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator, the crowd favorite Joe Amato from Old Forge, Pennsylvania, set both ends of the national record. He had an elapsed time of 5.11 at a speed of 280.37. In the second round, Amato not only backed up the 280, but actually improved on it to 280.98 miles an hour to take the national record. In the semifinals against Gary Ormsby, Amato was looking to back up the elapsed time record of 5.11. At this point in the season, Amato is looking for points from any source as he is locked in a struggle with Dick LaHaye and Daryl Gwynn. And Amato left too soon. No national ET record on this run. First-time finalist Tony Christian brought the Volante and Earl Pontiac Firebird to the starting line to race against Bob Glidden in the Pro Stock Final. Glidden was seeking his 57th national event title at this race. While Christian had a good start, he did not have the power necessary to compete against Glidden and Bob moved even closer to a world championship title. John Force took a unique means of wishing a happy anniversary to his wife, Lori, as he lined up in the finals against Mark Oswald. This a rematch of the recent Big Bud shootout at Indianapolis. Oswald was still looking for his first national event win of the 1987 season. He had been the dominant car at this event. Oswald had defeated not only Kenny Bernstein, but Don Prudhomme and Billy Meyer to reach the finals to race against John Ford. And Force instantly smoked the tires. That put him out of competition. And Mark Oswald, with a 5.49 second elapsed time, took home his first win of the year. I mean, we've struggled this year, Steve. Every little thing that could go wrong did him. I'm just happy for Motocraft and Ford and Paul and Leonard and everybody on the crew worked so hard, you know. feel sorry for John. They have to have another runner-up, but I didn't want to give it to him. 
The finals of Dop Fuel Eliminator at the Keystone Nationals found Gary Ormsby against Dick LaHaye. Ormsby received a tremendous break in the semifinals when the record-shattering Joe Amato went down to defeat by his own hand. He left the starting line too soon, and the red light put him out of competition and moved Ormsby into the finals. After more than two decades in the sport of championship drag racing, Dick LaHaye has enjoyed thus far his best season ever. That was highlighted by his second round win over Daryl Gwynn. LaHaye recorded a brilliant 5.12 elapsed time. Oh, so close to a new national record, his speed on that run was over 279 miles an hour. That also very close to the new speed record established by Joe Amato. For LaHaye in this final round, he had a number of thoughts on his mind. Most important was winning the race. But second, in order to keep pace with the bonus points by virtue of the speed record going to Amato, LaHaye wanted to back up that ET record. And back it up he did. A 5-14, the record and the win. You've won it for the second year in a row. You got the ET record at a 514. Oh, I'll tell you what, Steve. I can't thank the Lord enough. I mean, there's been so many prayers going on over there in that camp today that it's unreal because we've been kind of lost coming in these races because we kept smoking the tires and so forth, and we finally got it figured out, I guess. And it, I'm just thrilled to know, and I'll bet Kim is just ecstatic right now. Well, with LaHaye and Amato each setting a national record, the bonus points were neutralized. But with the win, LaHaye gained some ground. Mark Oswald's first one of the year put him in the third spot behind John Force and, of course, Kenny Bernstein. Bob Glidden, well, he continued to run away with it. The quest for the world championship moved back to Dallas, Texas, and the Texas Motorplex for the Chief Nationals. A capacity crowd was jammed into the Motorplex to watch some of the most exciting action that took place all season. Joe Amato, in qualifying, ran a best-ever 5.09 seconds at over 287 miles an hour. Also in qualifying, Gene Snow brought out his brand-new car and on its second fast ever, stunned the crowd with the quickest ET in history. I, mean, I can't hardly believe it. I mean, this is the only second run on this brand-new car. My crew, Gene Gaddy, that built the car, I can't believe it. It's wonderful. Yay! Great! While Gene Snow was celebrating, Eddie Hill crept up and broke the national speed record. Hill, in qualifying, set the record at over 283 miles an hour. On the funny car front, John Force established a new ET record at 5.39 seconds. But then watch as Ed McCulloch came out, took over the number one qualifying spot with a 5.36 second charge. Meanwhile, Mike Dunn became the first driver ever to run over 280 miles an hour at the wheel of a funny car. Not to be outdone, Bob Glidden took his Ford Thunderbird to a new Pro Stock ET record, that at 7.35 seconds. All of the excitement at the Chief Nationals was not in the record-setting department. Tim Gross provided a few thrills of his own. The billowing black smoke indicated a serious fire for Gross, but the NHRA safety requirements proved their worth once again as Gross came through this massive explosion in fire without injury.
just about the time the capacity crowd thought they had seen everything, the weird stuff began. Gene Snow lost to Michael Brotherton. And Dick LaHaye lost to Glenn Mikers. LaHaye thought his shot at the world championship was over. But wait, it's only started. Joe Amato shook the parachute out and lost to Jack Ostrander. A golden opportunity gone forever for Joe Amato. Daryl Gwynn did his best to confuse the world championship points chase. He took the ET record away with a 5.12 elapsed time. With that run, Gwynn improved his shot at the world title. The Gremlin struck in funny car as John Force went up in smoke and Jim Head took the win. And the capper to the first round saw Mike Dunn lose to Dom Hoover. But wait, there's more. As the top fuel semi-final unfolded, Daryl Gwynn raced against Gary Ormsby. Gwynn with every victory advancing further up the ladder in the Winston points chase. It was an incredible run for Gwynn and another national record 5.09 seconds elapsed time. Gwynn at over 281 miles an hour. As Eddie Hill watched the action by Daryl Gwynn, he said to himself, I can improve on that. And he bashed the speed record once again. In a semi-final run against Glenn Mikers, Hill took the national speed record to a mark of over 285 miles an hour. Pro Stock Eliminator final round found Butch Leal against Bob Glidden once again. But this was the second half of the season and Leal had fallen on harder times. After a slow start, Bob Glidden had come on strong in the latter half of the year and after winning the U.S. Nationals, had a commanding lead in the points chase. At the Chief Nationals, Glidden was out first and outpowered Leo and took the win at a 7.37 over 187 miles an hour. Ed McCullough came into the final round of Funny Car Eliminator seeking the backup to his national record for elapsed time. McCulloch was racing against the Dallas, Texas favorite, Raymond Beetle. After winning two races last year, McCulloch had yet to taste victory on the national event trail for 1987. The picture of consistency. McCulloch backed up his elapsed time record and won the Chief National. To pick this one off on the world's best track and set the record, you backed it up at 541. You are the all quickest right. of them all. All right, Steve-O. <laughs> you wouldn't even give me a clue. No, no, not to get that helmet off. <laughs> Let me tell you, this is great. I mean, we went through the guys today. This is what drag racing is all about. Little, little kiss from Raymond Beetle. Raymond. I don't know if that's a reward or not. You, guys, uh, you, you know, two have been best buddies for a long time. Years and years, we go back a long ways. You're thrilled. I'm thrilled to death. As we have seen so often this season, the quickest and fastest off times race each other. It happened again in the finals of Top Fuel Eliminator at the Chief National. The new national record holders, the ET holder, Daryl Gwynn, raced against the new speed record holder, Eddie Hill. 
kill the Texan from Wichita Falls, Daryl Gwynn at the age of 26 from Miami, Florida. And once again, Daryl Gwynn proved to be dominant with another new record, 5.084. That went into the record book. Daryl Gwynn, you have won the Chief Auto Parts Nationals, a new national record, 5.08. <laughs> it's about time I won this race. I've only been here twice and felt like I've been here for 10 years. This place has abused me, you know. You've always run well, but had bad luck. That's right. We've run well. We've set a bunch of records here, and uh, this really feels good, I'll tell you what. Well, the Winston World Championship battles appeared to be over in Funny Car and Pro Stock, but not among the kings of the sport. With his record rampage and his victory, Daryl Gwynn, for the first time since the Cajuns, moved into a position to challenge for the title. Two races remained on the national event circuit as the Tour pulled into Phoenix, Arizona, and the Castrol GTX Fall Nationals at Firebird Raceway. Gene Snow debuted a brand new car just one race ago and in doing so set the low ET mark in qualifying at the Chief National. At the Fall Nationals, he came in the number two qualifier on this run, but he also had some engine problems and an ensuing fire. Snow brought the car to a safe stop. He came back in eliminations and made it to the second round where he lost to Eddie Hill. Kenny Bernstein clinched his funny car title at Phoenix as he lost to Ed McCulloch, just qualifying and making the first round, won the title for Bernstein. The drama still centered on top fuel and what had to be done to win the world championship. Well, you know, Steve, coming into this race here, we're 456 points behind. Uh, if we need to set low ET or top speed or both, uh, which will accumulate us a couple or a hundred points on that standpoint. If we could touch a national record, it'd be nice, but I don't think it's going to happen at this racetrack. It, uh, with the high altitude and the temperature and the low humidity, it's hard to make these cars run as fast as they will in other places. We also need to go a couple rounds ahead of, or finish a couple rounds ahead of Joe so that we can accumulate a few points that way. Uh, there's 200 points around, and then that way going into the World Finals, you know, we'll be a little bit closer, and then we can just race head to head for it. Amato also knew what he had to do. Joe, what do you have to do to fend off Dick LaHaye for the overall world championship? What's your plan? Well, basically, we're just going to go out and race. You know, it's hard to try and look ahead and second guess yourself. There, there's, there's eight rounds of racing left. And we've got to do whatever he does within two rounds of that. You've been thinking about this. Oh, yeah. You, you, you run it over in your mind. There's no doubt about it. You know, you want to, you know, not make any mistakes. But, but you know, to try and second guess and qualify funny or do anything like that you know you don't want to do any of them things you want to just go out and and race hard and try and win the two races then that just eliminates him having a chance you know that's our goal <laughs> by virtue of their qualifying position LaHaye and Amato raced in the semi-finals in the first round Ed Moore fell to Joe Amato then it was Jack Ostrander in the second Dick LaHaye defeated Shirley Muldowney in his first round race and beat Connie Coletta in the second round. That earned him the right to face the points leader in the semis. A tremendous start by Amato, but the horsepower of Dick LaHaye proved to be too much and LaHaye put away Amato with a 5.28 second elapsed time. Amato used his starting line advantage to the fullest, but it did not withstand the charge of LaHaye. By mid-course, LaHaye had pulled even, and at the finish line, took the win. I can almost cry right now. We've been trying to win this thing all year. And uh, let me catch my breath here just for a second. It, uh, I feel like I've run it on Taking his breath completely away. Here's Joe Amato. It's a drag race. Thank you very much. Okay. See the winner. Well, Paul, you know, it. this has been a tough year for us. We have been just up and down and up and down. And we was down coming into this race. And I bet Kim and Jeff are just out of control right now. 
Dick LaHaye rode the crest of that victory wave into the finals, where the surprising Eddie Hill was his competition. Not only did both drivers have to contend with the problems of driving a 280 mile an hour race car, the shadows were lengthening over Firebird Raceway and the lights had been turned on. Eddie Hill's first final round appearance at an NHRA national event came a year ago at the Mile High Nationals in Denver, Colorado. Hill had laid out of the sport for some 15 or more years, becoming one of the best known and record-setting boat drag racers in history. Now, back on the asphalt, he is the holder of the national speed record and is matched against Dick LaHaye in the fall nationals finals. LaHaye left the starting line first. He continued to maintain that lead and won the Fall Nationals, earning him even more points in his quest for the World Championship title. The header flames were an instant indicator of who stood on the throttle first. It was Dick LaHaye and that advantage at the starting line, coupled with his continuing strong performance, gave LaHaye the victory. While the top fuel title was still up for grabs, Funny Car Eliminator had been decided much earlier in the day when Kenny Bernstein locked up the World Championship. But the Fall Nationals title was yet to be decided. Raymond Beadle in the final round against Mark Oswald. Oswald on a late season performance charge thundered down the quarter mile and took a decisive victory over Raymond Beadle. Oswald's time of 5.53 seconds at over 263 miles an hour. This was an important moment in the Winston Pro Stock World Championship. Butch Leal continued to have a mathematical chance of catching Bob Glidden, but he needed this victory to keep those World Championship hopes alive. The odds were certainly in Glidden's favor. He had won the last three events, starting with the U.S. Nationals, then the Keystone Nationals and the Chief Nationals. He was the number one qualifier here at the Fall National. And Glidden reversed the tables on Leal and pulled a tremendous hole shot or starting line advantage and outpowered Leal to take home the title. By defeating Joe Amato in the semis and ultimately Eddie Hill in the final round, Dick LaHaye pulled within one win light of Joe Amato for the World Championship with one race to go. In Funny Car and Pro Stock, it's official. Bernstein and Glidden will again wear the number one in 88. The last race of the season returned to where it all started nine months ago, the L.A. County Fairgrounds in Pomona, California. Pomona was a celebration of Bob Glidden's eighth Winston World Championship title. Bob Glidden's domination of pro stock racing is so complete, it seems every time he pilots the Motocraft Thunderbird down the quarter mile, he sets a new record of some kind. The two most impressive records, the ones totally without precedent, are his eight World Championships and 59 national event wins. The key to Glidden's success, both this year and in years past, has been his team, headed by wife Etta and man by sons Billy and Rusty. Their intensity and dedication have made them drag racing's ultimate team and made Bob the winningest driver in NHRA championship drag racing. Pomona in 1987 also saw Kenny Bernstein win the Winston Funny Car crowd. The driving ability of Kenny Bernstein, coupled with the incredible performance of the Budweiser King Funny Car, 
has produced a dynasty that in 1987 claimed its third straight world championship. Innovative, inventive, creative, the results of this team speak for themselves. 17 wins over three years, national records galore, and a consistent performance edge. While much of the credit for the car's performance lies with crew chief extraordinaire Dale Armstrong, it is the combination of Armstrong and Bernstein that makes this team unstoppable. For world champion Kenny Bernstein, the Winston Finals was not highlight film material. Kenny qualified well in the number five spot, but on Sunday morning, before the start of eliminations, the crew discovered engine problems. In the first round, Bernstein was matched against Jim Dunn. Both cars left hard, but then something went away on Kenny Bernstein's car. He lost traction and Dunn streaked on for the upset win. In the finals, the funny car eliminator, Ed McCulloch, was making his third final round appearance of the season. The elapsed time record holder was matched against Billy Meyer. After struggling most of the year, Meyer came into the Winston finals with renewed performance. McCulloch had problems right off the line, losing traction, and Meyer motored on for his second event win of the year, his 12th career NHRA win. For McCulloch, 1987 ended with him third in the point standings and the ET record. For world champion Bob Glidden, every national event is highlight film material, the Winston Finals no exception. Qualified number one for the 22nd consecutive time, Glidden easily moved into the finals, and he faced off against Joe Lapone, who tried to compensate for a performance disadvantage by leaving on Glidden, and unfortunately, he left the red light glowing. Glidden took home event win number 60. But the story that held the capacity crowd at the L.A. County Fairgrounds spellbound for two days was the battle for the Top Fuel World Championship between Joe Amato and Dick LaHaye. On Saturday, the fans got a taste of what was to come with the finals of the Krager Weld Wheel Top Fuel Classic. The Krager Classic features the eight quickest dragsters competing in a special elimination race for a $50,000 first prize. When the smoke had cleared after the first two rounds, it was Amato against LaHaye for the title. For Amato, this marked his third straight appearance in the Classic Finals. He won the inaugural race, was runner-up to Garlitz last year. For LaHaye, his first trip to the Finals. In a classic side-by-side -side race, Joe Amato inched out Dick LaHaye at the finish line to take home the $50,000 award. LaHaye left the line one one-thousandth of a second before Amato, gaining a very slight advantage. But at the far end, it was a charging Amato who squeaked by for the victory. Amato ran 5'11", 283 miles an hour to LaHaye's 5'12", 281. The Krager Weld Wheel Top Fuel Classic did not have a direct effect on the World Championship, but it certainly gave Amato a psychological edge going into Sunday's elimination. He would need that edge because in the semifinals, LaHaye and Amato met to decide the World Championship. The tightness of the points battle meant this was a winner-take-all race. The pressure on the two crew chiefs was evident. The engine essentially back together in the Joe Amato car. Crew chief Tim Richards, you've given Joey a very consistent car for two rounds. Your thoughts as you race for the world championship? Well, I, I feel as though that this is this is definitely the biggest run of our career, Joe and mine and uh, everybody else here. And it's real important to stay consistent on this track. The track seems to be going away a little bit, but we've got to go for it. I, I have to figure that LaHaye has a maybe a 17 or a 16 in his car, and we just have to go for it. I don't feel as though we're in a real good position here because we've we've been making a little too much heat in this car, and LaHaye isn't. So it's a lot easier for him to step up than it is us. We're, we're trying to back up at the same time we're trying to go fast. It's not a good situation. Does the luck. Well, we'll see what happens. Well, the situation here is that Dick LaHaye's daughter, Kim, is going to try to give her father a dragster that won't smoke the tires and will get a hold of the racetrack. Kim, your feelings, the world championship on the line. Well, we're just going to try to run the best that we can, and hopefully it won't smoke the tires. And whatever the outcome is, we're real happy with the year. LaHaye's path to the semifinal confrontation was through Shirley Muldowney in the first round and team owner Larry Miner in the second round. For a motto, he made it to the semifinals by besting Dan Fitzgerald in round number one and Frank Bradley in the second round. 
They left the line together, then just past the 100-foot mark, Amato's engine let go, and LaHaye took the win light in his first ever Top Fuel World Championship. For the first time in his 30-year racing career, a world championship, the Winston World Championship in $100,000, belongs to this man, Dick LaHaye, 519. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. I'm almost lost for words. You know, Dan Henley, the team manager for Winston, is busy taping your name on this check. It's a monstrous check for a monstrous amount of money, my friend. <laughs> well, thank you. A 20-year veteran of championship drag racing, Dick LaHaye became a major contender in 1987 with the help of Larry Miner and the Miller American race team. He delivered immediate results, the Top Fuel World Championship. LaHaye has a reputation as a smart, crafty racer, a man who is easy on parts and hard on competitors. His own knowledge of nitro racing, coupled with the growing abilities of daughter Kim as crew chief, put LaHaye into the winner's circle five times in 87, doubling his number of national event victories. Always a crowd favorite, LaHaye continues to give his fans something to cheer about. The newly crowned world champion came into the final round looking to tie Big Daddy Don Garlett's record of six top fuel wins in a single season. Between him and the record was Daryl Gwynn, who in the first round of racing electrified the crowd with a track record 509. LaHaye left on Gwynn, but the awesome power of the Gwynn dragster pushed him by Dick for his fourth event win of the season and third in the championship point standings. In a year of wonder, a year of wild dreams come true, the most heartfelt was the accomplishment of Dick LaHaye, winning his first ever Top Fuel World Championship. For Kenny Bernstein and Bob Glidden, they continued to set the standard for yet another year in their respective categories. For Steve Evans and Paul Page, I'm Dave McClellan saying so long for Drag Racing 87. <laughs>